this week we're going back to 1 Chronicles. Actually, 1 Chronicles really fits because, as I keep saying about Chronicles, the Chronicles was written for the people to remember and what God has done for his people. And it was written, don't forget, to those people who were generationally way, way apart from what had happened. Way, way apart from King David. There have been plenty of generations since King David and to now. So actually today, when we really do represent and recognise that some of our remembering is remembering not just what's happening now and recently, but stuff that would have happened back in World War I. We're generationally apart from that. If you may recall, uh, we said that uh, we went to Sarajevo on our trip, and while we was in Sarajevo, we were at the place where uh, Franz Ferdinand was shot, uh, assassinated, which sparked World War One. So today, and this one chronicles, is good for us to remember what God does and what he's about. So you're up for that this morning? Yes. Excellent. Well, let's look at, as I said, uh, we, I'm going to give you a quick summary of the last few chapters. Chapters 1 to 9, it's the genealogies. The best bedtime reading ever if you suffer from insomnia. But as I said, it's like the family tree. But it starts with Adam first, where we normally start with ourselves and work our way back. And then there's been lots of bits and bobs in between about how King David becomes king and the people are behind him. But this is the bit where we got to last time was they finally got the Ark into Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant, the representation of God's presence into the Jerusalem because they did it in the prescribed way, the way that God wanted it, not their own way. Do you remember? So the ark is in Jerusalem. Look, I know it's cold. I don't know why the heating's not quite working the way it should be this morning. It is a bit frustrating, I agree with you, but notice I put on a wool suit, so I'm warm. Right, I, I'm going to quickly through, we're going to look at 1 uh, Chronicles 16 um, and I want us just to look at a few of the verses in there. So I'm looking at uh, verse 4 to start with and then working our way uh, to verse 6 and then jumping straight to 37 and 42. So just a quickie, uh, so it's in the right place, it's there and they've been celebrating. So then David appointed the following Levites to lead the people in worship before the ark of the Lord, to invoke his blessing, to give thanks and praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph, the leader of this group, sounded the cymbals. Second to him was Zechariah, followed by Jael, Shemaranamoth, Jahil, Mathathi, Elilab, Benaniah, Obed, Edom, and Jael. They played the harps and lyres. The priests, Benaniah and Jahazel, played the trumpets regularly before the Ark of God's Covenant. And when we're out of Chronicles and these bad names, I'll be really happy. Flipping straight to 37 to 42. David arranged for Asaph and his fellow Levites to serve regularly before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, doing whatever needed to be done each day. This group included Obed-Edom, son of Jehorathon, Hosea and 68 other Levites as gatekeepers. Meanwhile, David stationed Zadok the priest and his fellow priests at the tabernacle of the Lord at the place of worship in Gibeon, where they continued to minister before the Lord. They sacrificed the regular burnt offerings to the Lord each morning and evening on the altar set aside for that purpose, obeying everything written in the law of the Lord. And as he had commanded Israel, David also appointed Heman, Jedathan, and the others chosen by name to give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. They used their trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments to accompany their songs of praise to God. And the sons of Jedathan were appointed as gatekeepers. Well... 
For me, what's really key out of that is there are key appointments by people to do their tasks. Levites, priests, is, is, or second line of priestlyhood. So their role is to do their tasks. You've got those who are to bang the cymbals. It's like Andy Robertson, isn't it? Who's now left. Notice he's not there, he's helping me out. And I wanted to take the mic, but he's not here. What a shame. There are others that are appointed to be gatekeepers. Others to serve at the altar on a daily basis. Basically, everybody's been given an appointment and a task. And it very clearly states in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. We are royal priests, amen? Those of us that know Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we're royal priests. And it can be gender neutral, it's okay. Doesn't make any odds if you're a man. I'm really banging on about this gender neutral thing, it's doing my head in. But it doesn't make any odds if you're male or female, we're all raw priests. There should be a massive shout out from the women at this point. That's all do. I expect there to be raucousness, by the way, at your social this afternoon. Okay, all right, fine. Right, anyway. So therefore then, this tells me that everybody is appointed with certain duties. And you're given these duties based upon your gifts. No good the gatekeepers, being an Andy Robertson, he's here now, being an Andy Robertson and banging a cymbal, because that's not their role, is it? And equally, it'd be no good a cymbal banger being a gatekeeper. That's not where their talent lies. And so all of us have gifts. We're all royal priests. We all have tasks that God has given us. And it's no good deferring that task to somebody else who's not gifted in that way. We all have to take up our duty. Amen? Amen. And so we're all being given tasks. So actually, in the kingdom of God, nobody is useless. Thank you, my sister. Nobody is useless. Just want that to sink in with some of you for some reason this morning. That nobody is useless in the kingdom of God. We all have roles, we all have tasks. It doesn't mean, but note the phrase I'm using, by the way, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God isn't just inside Greenford Baptist Church, I'm glad to say. But every single one of us who knows Jesus Christ, the Lord and Saviour, has a role. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, he has a role for you as well. You just need to accept him as your Lord and Saviour, and then you're going to find out what that is. So I don't care if you're not like me, able to stand at the front and spout out a lot. Or you're somebody who does things quietly behind the background. Each of us has our role. So if you're feeling today, oh, well, I don't do much, or I haven't got any gifts, or I've got nothing to do, I can't be like so-and-so, that's fine. Because you're not meant to be like so-and-so. You are meant to have your own gift, your own role that God has given you. So, nobody's useless, amen? amen. Say, I'm not useless. I'm not useless. Actually, say again, I am not useless. I'm not useless. God, wants God wants to use me. God has gifted me. God has appointed me. Has appointed me. That sounded slightly less enthusiastic. God has appointed me. God has appointed Amen. Amen. None of this was in my sermon. This is going well. Right. Let's continue, shall we? Verse 43 in, uh, in uh, 1 Chronicles. I just want to note this. It says in, in, the, in 16, the last thing, that all the people returned to their homes and David turned and went home to bless his own family. Just interesting. 
They made sure that the kingdom of God was sorted out first, i.e. the tabernacle would arrive. They've celebrated and worshipped that in the tabernacle, that the Ark of the Covenant is there now. And it's sorted. And they celebrated and worshipped together, recognising God's presence. And then they went off and sorted out their own family. Everybody returned to their homes. And it's almost that for me in, uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where it says, Seek first the kingdom of God... And then everything else will come on to you. I'm using a very old Bible verse, but that's the only one that's stuck in my head. But it is always seek God first and everything else will follow. So therefore then it's serve God first and then you sort out your family. Now the problem is, and your friends after that, the problem is some of us take it the other way. We sort out family first and then worry about what God wants. Actually, God says, sort me out first. I'll tell you how to deal with your family and sort them out as you serve me. Now, it also goes the other way, that some people go, I'm serving the Lord, and they actually ignorantly ignore their entire family and their entire relationship with them. That's wrong as well. There's a season for everything. There's a timing for everything. So if King David himself, the king of all Israel, sought the kingdom of God, then went and sought out his own family, I think we should take the same vein, should we not? <laughs> Seek the kingdom of God first. Okay, chapter 17. Told you with 1 Chronicles, we flick through a lot of it very quickly. Okay, chapter 17. Uh, verses 1 to uh, 2. When David was settled in his palace, he summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I'm living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the Ark of the Lord's Covenant is out there under a tent. Nathan replied to David, do whatever you have in mind, for God is with you. I want to stop it there. It's been a time lapse now. Been some time period has gone past. David's settled in his palace, isn't it? He's got his leather TV viewing couch. He's got his feet up. He's chilled now. Yeah, he's set up his PS4. He's, oh, sorry, is that me on a Sunday afternoon? Sorry, no. I don't have a PS4, so I don't know where I'm getting that from. No, David is now settled. Otherwise, what that's saying is there's sort of a semblance of time of, of settlement. Things have settled down. Life is going on. And David clearly sees that the Ark of the Covenant is still underneath a tent. It hasn't got this magnificent home that he feels it should have. Remember what the Ark represents. It repre represents God's presence amongst the nation. So God hasn't got a house. So he wants to build a house. So I love Nathan's response. Nathan is the chief prophet to the king. Yeah? And I love his response. Oh, what a lovely idea. Go on, go off. God's with you. Go and get on with it. Doesn't actually ask God first. Did you notice that? Do you think they might have learned from that previous lesson with the Ark of the Covenant when they tried to move it first without asking God how we meant to do this? Do you think they might have learned the lesson? No. So here's the thing. When we know that we've done something wrong and then eventually ask God, and then God told us the right way to do it, do we learn the lesson for the next time? Some, not always. That's a better phrase. Thanks. Sometimes we do. And it becomes eventually learned behaviour. But they didn't do it. And sometimes we don't do it. We go headlong. We go, well, hey, this is a good idea. We have people around us that go, do you know, that sounds like a really great idea. Go ahead and do it. Oh, yeah, that sounds logical. Go ahead and do it. God doesn't do logic. He does God's way, which is not normally our way. He does do logic. No, sometimes it's just a bit obvious, really. But there's other times it's not. And God's saying, can you wait for me? I'm not quite there yet. Would you like to wait for me? Inquire of me first, then make the decisions.
I'm a trumpeter for the Lord. So anyway, so God then comes and sees Nathan in a dream. So here we go. But that same night, God said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. You are not the one to build a house for me to live in. I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. My home has always been a tent moving from one place to another in a tabernacle. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel leaders, the shepherds of my people. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's army has declared. I took you from tending sheep. Actually, no, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Sorry. The key thing for me here, I've never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? My home has always been a tent moving from one place to another in a tabernacle. It's quite something interesting, isn't it? We enjoy settling, don't we? Have, have you noticed that? We humans do like to settle. I made a bit of a joke there about King David settling in his leather couch, watching his TV or playing his PS4. But generally on the whole, we like to settle. I mean, how many times after about half an hour here in the building, you're sitting there thinking, I want to go home? No? Oh, OK, I'll take that back then. OK, after about an hour. If I shut the heating off completely now. Yeah, OK, see, see, I'll see what you mean. We like to settle. We like to have a home where we are settled, where we can rest our heads. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, about three o'clock this afternoon, I'm sure you're all after lunch. Want to go? <laughs> <laughs> and I bet sometimes when we looked outside this morning, we went, oh man, that's cold. Go and go back over in the duvet, yeah? We humans love to settle. So there is a sense here that's quite right, that what God said was, here you go, Israelites, this is the land, this is where you're going to be, go. And they got to settle in the land. But they assume, therefore, that means that God wants to settle. And God's got to have a house. And God said, I've never complained. Could you imagine the idea of God whining? But I've never complained. I've never asked for this. I've always moved around in my tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant represents what? The presence of God. So God is not somebody who settles. He is also a presence, means that it says it's not in one place. So it's not like you come to this building and God is here and he's not there when it's outside. Now, take that, flip that now into the New uh, Testament. Uh, in John's Gospel, right at the beginning, it says, and he came and made his, and he tabernacled with us. God in Jesus actually tabernacled with us, came and tented. Now, Jesus didn't settle, did he? When asked, where are you going? Well, he said, no, son of man has no place to rest his head. Jesus never settled. He moved around. And then when Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you, those who know me, we are God's presence now. Yes? yes. Amen? You who have the Holy Spirit living in you, you who have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, by the way, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, got back to, guaranteed you have the Holy Spirit living in with you, you are God's presence now. And you're quite mobile, last time I checked, yeah? You don't live here, do you, in this building? You, 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 you didn't sleep here last night, did you? I might sometimes feel like I have done, but... No, it's not because I've dozed off in the office in the afternoon. I remember those comments being made. <laughs> Mr. Robertson. Didn't he do well this morning so far? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what was I saying? Oh, Hang on, let's go back one, a bit more, less mobile. Oh, yes. So, you didn't sleep here, so you moved from your house or your home to here, didn't you? You're mobile. And did you know each step that you took, you walked the tabernacle of God? You've walked it. You've brought God. Yes? 
We can do that. That's our role. That's our job. Each and every single one of us at least got that role to walk God's presence. Now, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. But Jesus was the exact representation of God the Father, wasn't he? He said, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. The same works for us, by the way. If people see us, they've seen the Father. Isn't that a scary responsibility? But it's how we enact our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, as those who tabernacle, who are for the very living Holy Spirit, the very representation of God here on earth, because that's our role as the church. We're the very body of Christ, and we're all individually made up as that body of Christ. We give and we walk the Father's presence everywhere. We are his representation. You know, when it says you're made in the image of God, actually what it means is, You are the agent of God. You're the representation of God. Wow. And God's not static. Now, that also means, takes me for another uh, another step forward, is that we do like to settle. God's not in for settling. He doesn't like things just to be the status quo and nice and safe. God is not a God of safeness. As good old C.S. Lewis said, but he is good. And we can't afford to settle. We must always be seeking where God is at work. What is he wanting us to do? Where does he want us to go? We shouldn't be settling. We humans don't like change much, do we? No. No, God... God is saying, you know, I am faithful, I am Yechesed, I never change, I'm forever here. But he does, his love for us never changes, his faithfulness for us. His faithfulness for us, that was not good, Warren, never changes. But what he does, his modus operandi, does change. He's forever moving, because he forever wants to take ground for his kingdom. He is not static. So, anyway. So that's why he's never really asked for a temple to be built. But he, uh, as we know, he does relent and will relent as such. And he does allow a temple to be built. So here we are. Verse seven. Now go and say to my servant, David, this is what the Lord of heaven, heaven's army has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture And selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Sorry, doesn't that sound like Deuteronomy 31.8? I will go ahead of you. I will go with you. I will neither fail you nor abandon you. Deuteronomy 31.8, which Liz is carrying on with the women's tonight, yes? And I will provide homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. Starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people in Israel and I will defeat all your enemies. Furthermore, I declare that the Lord will build a house for you, King David. This is a dynasty of kings. For when you die and join your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, one of your sons, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for me, and I will secure his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. I will never take my favor from him as I took it from the one who ruled before you. I will confirm him as king over my house and my kingdom for all time. And his throne will be secure forever. So David went back. So sorry. So Nathan went back to David and told him everything the Lord had said to him in a vision. Wow, there's a game chamber. I just want to note two things. First and foremost, David is taken from being a shepherd boy to the king. Identity change. Identity change. And we all, from the minute we accept Jesus Christ. And as we travel on that journey with him, we have an identity change. We start becoming the very people that God wanted us originally to be. We don't stand still. We don't remain in that. David would have identified himself as a shepherd. I bet he never thought that he would be a 
king. I bet we've always, before we knew Christ, identified ourselves in certain aspects. I don't know, I am the child of so-and-so parents, or I am the parent of so-and-so child, or I'm so-and-so's friend. Never probably recognised until we came to know Jesus that we'd be known as the children of God. Identity change, and we have to go on those journeys. We have to go on those journeys. It's a game changer to be known and to go on. So that's one thing I also want to talk about is the fact that God says, I will give you peace. Now, we know ultimately that peace didn't last forever. Why? Because they disobeyed God consistently. One off disobedience of God is OK. Do you know something? Some people sometimes think I've just disobeyed God today. That's it. I can't find peace now. My whole life is in distress. That's not what it's here. The Israelites generationally for ages disobeyed God, even though God kept sending in the mornings. Hello, I'm over here. You're in the wrong place. And so eventually went, well, that's it. Your sins got too big. I need to sort you out now. But he sought them out as a loving father who disciplines his children. So I just want us to note, okay? And then this is the bit for me today that's the biggest thing here. It is actually uh, this moment that he's saying, but for you, David, I am going to build a dynasty. Do you know when I was a kid, I used to read that as dynasty. Anyway, a dynasty, sorry, sideline, a dynasty. I'm going to build a dynasty for you. I'm going to build a dynasty that's going to be everlasting. There's going to be forever somebody in your throne room. Now, that's amazing. He, see, because for David, in the, the, the way he thought from his upbringing and the whole of the Israelites people thought, it's never just about them. They see the stuff for the future that's more important. Their name to be almost marked down in history, even though they will die, is more important to them than what they get here and now. For him... This God's promising, I'm going to give you a dynasty that's going to be everlasting. I'm never going to remove my spirit. Now, we know, if you look at the end, that actually, in human terms, King David's descendants died out. But who didn't die out? Who was known as the everlasting son of David? No, nope, everlasting son of David. Jesus. Jesus eventually becomes the Messiah connection and that's why it's forevermore see when the Israelites would have read that they would have seen that more in human terms but we can now look back and see what God was predicting prophesying was actually about Jesus and Jesus does sit on the throne of David forever does he not yes. so just take that forward that he actually thought for David, it's much more than just the here and now. For him, this is going to be your dynasty. This is going to be your future. There's going to be forever your name marked. Wow. So there is definitely an identity change, isn't it? Shepherd boy, king, everlasting dynasty. Wow. I think that's quite, okay. For me, I think that's quite cool. What I want to look at is actually King David's response to this verse 16 then King David went in and sat before the Lord and prayed now just take that for a moment if God suddenly came to you and said right you're going to have an everlasting dynasty your name is going to be known forever and ever and ever I mean, King David, 2,000 years on, he's still being spoken about. Yeah? And you're going to be forever known as this great king. You're going to be like the starter king of Israel as such. Forget Saul. Saul was a completely self-delusional what's it. This is what's going to happen, yeah? What would be your first reaction? Being honest. Come on, what would be your first reaction? Woohoo! No? No, is that just me then? Okay, maybe I'm self-centred. Right, okay. Probably am, according to Joy. But, but most of us will be either, ah, or some of us will be honest and go, oh, uh-huh, what does that mean? 
We all have different reactions, but King David decides that he went in and sat before the Lord and prayed. Notice there's no vision of him here going, oh, let's create a party to worship the Lord, shall we? So I can then stand up the front and give testimony. Do you know what the Lord's done for me? Nothing wrong with that, by the way, sorry. Testimony is a good thing. But he actually went off and prayed with the Lord. And this is what his words were. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And now, O God, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving your servant a lasting dynasty. I love that word that David sees himself, even though he's king, he sees himself as a servant. Even though we're royal priests, we are servants of the Lord. Amen? Amen. One should never think too highly of themselves. You speak as though I were someone very great, O Lord God. What more can I say to you about the way you have honoured me? You know what your servant is really like. That's the bit I like. There is a real humility for me here in, in King David that I'm still your servant. Even though he'll have everybody around him saying, oh, King David, you're right, King David, you're right, my majesty, you're all right. Underneath, he's like, that's nothing. I'm still a servant of the Lord. And then this great humility of like, you know what I'm really like? You know what really goes on in my head and my heart? Do you really know how I think about, I don't know, these various characters around in my courts? I mean, we thought, you know, do you ever consider all these people that he's appointed into the temple? We may not actually have liked them. Do you ever consider he may not actually have thought they were the greatest thing since last bread? He might have thought, well, that one there really, I've got to be careful I'm doing my hand pointing. Not so, you know, because I don't want people to think, oh, Warren doesn't like me. No, I'm not. It's not that at all. You know, it could be somebody there. And he said, well, I've got to appoint that person. Because they, uh, uh, God's told me to. But it doesn't mean I particularly like them or I particularly get along with them very well. And that might be in the back of his head. Yeah, you've all got people in the workplace that you have to work with. And you, don't, but you know they're good at their job. You just don't quite get along with them very well. There's personality clashes, yeah? But you have to sort of override your person with the, this person's good at their job. So... David knows these thoughts. He knows probably when he sits here and, I don't know, I'm, I'm just making this stuff up I go along, but bear with me. You know, pretty lady walks in. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, he does that, doesn't he, with Bathsheba. But you know what I mean? He knows, he knows that God, and he might wake up sometimes and think, you know, it's too cold outside, I can't be bothered, turn over and go to sleep. God knows what goes on in his heart, really, and in his mind. And he's saying, but you know all this. And it reminds me of Psalm 139. For God, you know my thoughts. I cannot hide one from them. Yet, you still love me. Yet, you're going to do this for me, says David. What? Mind blower. So take that to ourselves. That's a mind blower, isn't it? That God says, you're a royal priest. I can still use you in the kingdom of God. Yes? yes. Right, good. You're not useless. So I'm finishing in 10 minutes, don't worry. You're not useless. God still wants to use you, yes? yes? I know what you thought last night, that movie you watched last night. Oh, well, that's a bit more giggling. <laughs> thought we'd touch something at some point. Yeah? But God says, but do not worry. I'm still going to make something of you. i still got uses for you. Now, we're not going to have a King David everlasting dynasty, but I don't care what humans think about it. As long as I've got the everlasting with God through Jesus Christ, who cares? Amen? Amen. Right. So, point being, God says, I know what you really like, but I still love you. I know. That's called, by the way, God's grace. And that's what's going on here. King David recognises God's grace. So for the sake of your servant, O Lord, and according to your will, you have done all these great things and have made them known. Verse 20. O Lord, there is no one like you. 
We have never even heard of another God like you. What other nation on earth is like your people Israel? What other nation of God have you redeemed from slavery to be your own people? By the way, that's us. We are redeemed from the slavery to sin to be his people. Amen? Amen. There is no other God like him, isn't there? Is there? Good. You made, great, you made a great name for yourself when you redeemed your people from Egypt. You performed awesome miracles and drove out nations that stood in our way. And some of us experience God driving people out of our way. Yes? Or making the way clear. Yes? You chose Israel to be your very own people forever and you, O Lord, became their God. He has chosen you to be his people forever. To use a quote, that's a mighty long time. And we need to live in the light of that. No matter what you've done, you're chosen to be his people, his person, forever. I, maybe it's to me, I get excited about that. And God has become your God. And now, O oh Lord, I am your servant, he says. Do as you've promised concerning me and my family. May it be a promise that will last forever. This is what I love. May it be a promise that lasts forever. Maybe David probably knew about his future family and what they might be like. And may your name be established and honoured forever so that everyone will say, the lords of heaven's armies, the God of Israel is Israel's God. And may the house of your servant David continue before, before you forever. Oh my God, I have been bold enough to pray to you because you have revealed to your servant that you will build a house for him, a dynasty of kings. I want to hold on that verse 25. I've been bold enough to pray to you because you revealed your servant that you will build a house for him. He's bold enough to pray to God. He's bold enough to have a conversation with the creator and the sustainer of the universe. He's bold enough to talk to the majesty of the entire universe. Yes? yes. Why? Because he recognises the grace of God beyond, uh, upon him. Now, for David, this has just come through a communication of what he's going to do for him. Dynasty of kings forever. Yeah? What God says to us is, I've given you a dynasty of living with me forever. So boldly approach the throne of grace and talk to him. Boldly approach every day that you wake up knowing that God is your God. Amen? Amen. That his grace is forever there. It's not a cheap grace, it's actually a costly grace. Like the cost that we're remembering today on Remembrance Day, the cost of Jesus Christ dying on that cross was the ultimate cost. It wasn't cheaply given and we should never cheaply receive it. Like we Remembrance Day Sunday, when I said earlier on, we should never receive the cheap sacrifice cheaply. We should receive this freedom we have in this country and around the world, we should never receive it cheaply. We should forever be grateful for the sacrifices that have been made. And the same with the grace of God. We do not receive it cheaply. We receive it recognising we as servants have got it from the cost of his son dying on the cross who never deserved to die. But we don't hang our head in shame. We do exactly as David is saying here. I have been bold enough to pray to you. Why? Because of God's grace. Amen? Amen? In uh, Hebrews uh, uh, 4.13, uh, it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one whom we are accountable. At which point, most of us tremble. Everything is, nothing is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. That's not really a particularly pleasant idea, is it? Is it? There, but it carries on. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Amen? So what does this, this all mean for us? Well, as I said, we walk around the grace of God as well. If God is a tabernacle God who never wanted a permanent place to settle and he's one that always moves and we're that movement, we also walk around the grace of God. So there might be people you'll come across who need the grace of God. You're to bring that grace of God to them. But equally, we are to receive that grace and recognise that grace upon us, that the majesty has got his grace upon us. We've got it. So we can boldly approach everything. We can boldly approach the throne of God knowing that his grace is abounding us and we can ask him things for the lives of those around us as well as ourselves. Amen? Amen. We can stand boldly before our God. And then it finishes on 27. And now it has pleased you to bless the house of your servant so that it will continue forever before you. For when you grant a blessing, O Lord, it is an eternal blessing. Said King David, when God was saying about this this dynasty of kings, David, in the physical terms, was never going to see it fulfilled. Because he was going to die before it happens, yeah? We may not see everything that's going to be a dynasty for us, but what we do know is that what we look to is the hope and the future that we have been promised, that forever we will be with God. And when he makes a promise, it lasts forever. So when you become before the majesty of the creator and the sustainer of the universe, we come as servants, blessed in his grace and mercy, knowing that we can walk this earth for now showered in it and giving grace to others. Let's bow our heads. Listen to God just for a moment for yourself. Some of you, God has really gone and touched a point with you, trying to shower his grace upon you. Singers and musicians are gonna come up soon, but let me just continue. Just stay where you are for a minute. Not the singers and musicians, everybody else. I just want to thank God. Lord, I just want to thank you for your grace upon us. Thank you for the lessons of 1 Chronicles. Thank you that we can learn that actually we should learn to inquire of you in all occasions. But actually that inquiry, we can come to you boldly because of the grace that you have given us through your son Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be people who are graceful to others, that show your love. But Lord, for all of us, help us to be people who live that grace for ourselves as well. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.